In the previous video, we described backpropagation in these basic steps. There, we focused on making the trade-off between numeric and symbolic computation and working out local derivatives. However, there is one final ingredient to backpropagation, which will show us where the name comes from. If we carefully accumulate our computed derivatives, we will see that we can compute all derivatives we need in a single walk down the graph. The first thing we have to do is draw a proper computation graph. The diagram we've used so far for neural networks provides a kind of model perspective. It separates the inputs and the intermediate values, which are on the nodes, from the model parameters, which are on the edges. In a proper computation graph, all the values that go into our computation and come out of it are nodes, whether they're parameters of a model or inputs. We draw these as circles. Note, for instance, that in the first layer, both the inputs x and the parameters w's are drawn as circles going into our first computation. For the computations, we'll introduce a new type of node drawn as a diamond, and the edges tell us which values are the inputs of a particular computation and which is the output. We've drawn only part of the computation graph here to keep things simple because the full computation graph for this network would have as many as 22 nodes. Note also that we've included here the computation of the loss, and this is because when we compute gradients, we're always interested in the derivative of the loss with respect to the parameters. Therefore, the computation of the loss should be part of the computation graph. We can now write down the computations performed by each of these diamond nodes. The computation graph, together with the definitions of these computations, defines everything we need to know about the neural network. With that, backpropagation is defined in these four steps. We do a forward pass, computing the output of our computation graph, the loss, given its inputs. And then for the backward pass, we start at the top of our computation graph at the loss, and we work our way back down, computing the derivative for every single node, whether it represents a parameter or an intermediate value. Let's see how that works for our example network. The last computation in our computation graph, computed at the very top, is the one that computes the loss from the network output and the target value. We can compute the derivative of the loss with respect to both these input nodes. The derivative of the loss with respect to y we already saw in the last video, and the derivative of the loss with respect to t is the same but with a sign change. Now these derivatives are not directly useful to us yet, because neither y nor t are values we can change directly. t, the target, is given by the data, so we cannot change that at all, and y we can only change indirectly, by changing our parameters. What we can do, however, is imagine that we could change y directly. In such a case, this derivative tells us how we would update y if we could. Specifically, we would use this update rule, which works out like this. We can think of this as a kind of imaginary gradient descent update. If we had full control over the model output, this is how we'd like to change it. We don't, so what we need to do is take this derivative and reason backwards through our computation to figure out how we need to change all the values in our computation graph that we can control in order to get as close to this gradient update as possible. Next, we move to the computation directly below the one that produces y as an output, and takes among its inputs h1 and v1. We can compute a derivative for each input, but for now we'll focus on h1. Applying the chain rule tells us that we can break up the derivative of the loss with respect to h1 into the derivative of the loss with respect to y times the derivative of y with respect to h1. We can work both of these out. The first gives us the familiar expression 2 times y minus t, and the second gives us the expression v1. And what we notice here is that this factor, the derivative of the loss with respect to our output, is one we've already computed. And this shows us a general rule about backpropagation on computation graphs. If we have a node feeding into a computation, the global derivative of the loss with respect to that node is always the global derivative of the loss with respect to the output of the computation 
times the local derivative of the output of the computation with respect to the input. This follows directly from an application of the chain rule. The key to backpropagation is that if we traverse the graph in the right order, the first derivative, the loss over the output of the current computation, is always something we have already computed. If we take care that we work out the derivatives in the reverse order in which we computed them, we will only ever need to work out the local derivative of the current computation. With this notion in hand, we can go back to our computation graph and work our way down. For every input of every computation, we can work out the derivative in terms of the derivative of the output of the current computation. We never need to worry about what happens after the output because the derivative of the loss with respect to the output has already been computed. For instance, if, we're, if we want to work out the derivative of the loss with respect to parameter v1, we can apply the chain rule specifically to this computation here, which tells us that the derivative of the loss with respect to v1 is equal to the derivative of the loss with respect to y times the derivative of y with respect to v1. And we can work out the factor on the right, which is one of the local derivatives of this computation over here. But the factor on the left, we don't need to work out because we know for a fact that we've already computed it. Once we have the local derivative worked out, we simply fill in the value h1 from the forward pass and multiply it by this global derivative that we worked out in the previous step. Once we are done with a computation, we just move down the computation graph to the next one. We don't care whether nodes represent parameters of the model like v1, which we can change directly, or intermediate values like h1, which we can only change indirectly. We want derivatives for all nodes in the graph because we'll need them to work out derivatives for any node below. In this case, we deal with the node that computes the activation function. Since we already have the derivative of the loss with respect to h1 worked out in the previous slide, we only need to apply the chain rule once. This breaks up the computation of the derivative that we need, L over K1, into one derivative we've already computed, L over H1, and one local derivative, H1 over K1. Now we know that this computation that we're focusing on is the computation of the sigmoid function. And the derivative of the sigmoid function, we know, is the sigmoid function itself times one minus the sigmoid function itself. So this, gives us the correct expression for the local derivative. And we can fill in the values k1 from our forward pass. However, note that this sigmoid of k1 and this sigmoid of k1 over here are values that we already computed in the forward pass. So we can also write our local derivative like this. And moving one computation down brings us to the final step. We've left out the computation of the biases, so if you want to test whether you really understand what's happening here, it's a good exercise to see if you can work those out for yourself. This then is the full backpropagation algorithm. If we move down the graph from the loss node, all we need to do is take the derivative of the loss with respect to the input and multiply it by the local derivative the derivative of the output of the computation with respect to the input. Note that in practice we are doing a lot of this by hand rather than in a computer program. We never actually store a computation graph in the computer. We just draw it with pen and paper and use it to work out all the rules for computing derivatives efficiently. Once we've done this, we can write these down in a computer program. Here is what backpropagation looks like in pseudocode for our neural network. We start at the top with a computation that computes our loss and the derivative over the input of this computation y is two times y minus t. We call that dy as in the derivative for y. Next we need to loop over all the nodes in the hidden layers and their corresponding parameters v. For each of these as we've worked out for each parameter v, the derivative for v is the derivative for y times hi. And for each hidden node hi, its derivative is the derivative of y times the corresponding vi.
Next, we need to take care of all the activations of all the hidden nodes. There are three of these. And for each of them, as we saw before, the derivative of the loss with respect to the unactivated node Ki is the derivative for Hi, which we've previously computed, times the value of Hi itself, times 1 minus Hi. Moving one step down, we get one parameter connecting every input node to every hidden node, which requires two loops, one over the hidden nodes and one over the input nodes. And as we worked out previously, for the parameter that links input node i to output node j, its derivative is the derivative for the output node j times the input value xi. That is where we will leave backpropagation for now. This is how it was done in the early days of neural networks, up to the turn of the century. However, once we began to recognize that neural networks could actually work and work very well, we needed ways to speed up their computation. The most effective way to achieve this is to describe the whole computation in terms of matrix multiplication and addition, together with the occasional element-wise nonlinear operation. This allows us to write down the operation of a neural network very elegantly, and to use highly optimized routines for matrix multiplication, possibly on special hardware like a GPU. In order to make proper use of this, we should also work out how the backpropagation algorithm works in terms of matrix multiplications. And that is where we'll pick things up next week in the first deep learning lecture.